Welcome everybody, my name is Jan and today we will be talking about the fast pinball system and I will show you my system, we will play a little bit with it and in the beginning I will show or I will explain a little bit how this technically works, how you wire it up, uh, what options exist and also what other systems uh, fast has. So without further ado, this will be our agenda. First, we will talk about the fast nano. That's the fast controller board, basically. So that's the, the bus master. Then they got like a bunch of IO boards to control yeah, coils and switches. And those connect to the nano. And in the third uh, point, I will show how, how this fast bus, it's a bus system, how that's wired up, because it's a little bit different than other manufacturers that are doing it. And then I will also talk about other fast boards, uh, what they got, uh, yeah, what other offerings they have, some in kind of like limited availability and some in general availability. And afterwards, we will look at the stuff which uh, I will show you in the next few minutes. So let's talk about the fast nano first. Um, it's called nano because initially they got like a wpc controller which was that size i think a few prototypes of that actually exist but it's nothing which they are selling commercially so later on they came up with the nano which is just the controller to control their bus in addition it has uh, four serial led chains so you can you can control like this uh, ws 2011 uh, 28 11 or 28, 12 uh, LEDs. Um, and then there are two additional serial ports which are unused and I think you can use them. So we'll just shortly show you how the Nano looks. So um, that's the Nano. So it connects via a micro USB. I think it's mini USB. It's mini USB and there's power here. So you connect. Um, Five and four volts here. Those are the serial chains here, and those are the bus connections, uh, which we were talking about later. Let me power it up, and then it will also start blinking. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically it shows you that it got power and. And there's like some more lights for bus activity, which is currently not active because it's not running. Okay, that's the nano. And then we got I.O. boards and fast has three different board types. You can you can combine that in any order. Um, there's like the 3208, the 1616 and the 0804. And the only difference is the number of inputs and coils. So like the 3208, it's 32 inputs, 8 coils. 16, 16 is 16 inputs, 16 coils. And uh, 0804 is 8 inputs, uh, 4 coils. So like if you look at those, um, it's a pretty nice combination in my opinion. So uh, 32 inputs versus 8 coils is actually like the typical ratio between inputs and coils which you got uh, in, in pinball machines so like a modern stern machine has like 12 to 16 coils roughly depending on what it is so if it's a pro or if it's an le and it has about 64 switches sometimes a little bit less and that's 48 to 64 switches so you can see like most pinball machines can from the sheer number can be driven by two 3208s that's absolutely sufficient for, for most pinball machines. So you see like designs which got one uh, 3208 and 10804. Um, it's very typical combination. Sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes two of the uh, 0804s, but that's the typical combination. So personally, I do, don't see so many use cases for the 1616 because it's just too many coils. It's very rare that you need that many additional coils and that few switches. 
So there might be applications if you got like a machine with a lot of coils. If you, I don't know, if you want to, for example, uh, run score reels in your back box, that might be a use case where you got a lot of coils. But in modern machines, it's it's rather unlikely that you got that many coils. Maybe if you run like um, traditional bulbs for for GIs or something, but in most designs you go with 3208 and 0804. That's the typical combinations. They even like people which are saying, yeah, I want a lot of boards below my playfield, and they run like multiple 0804s. It's also also like a good. Um, it's also yeah a good combination. So that's also what I'm using. So I'm using uh, 3208 and um, 0804. I think I do not even have a 1616, to be honest. No, I don't think I have one. Um, and those boards look like this. So that's the Nano and that's the uh, 3208. So it has like eight coils here. And those are like 32 switches. And then there's an additional connector for daughter boards. I will talk about that later. Um, there's some stuff which you can put on top of it. That's not boards. They, they, they chain and um, generally just work. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do. Um, next, we will talk about how the bus works. So that's a little bit special. So it works this way. So the, the Nano has two uh, RG45 connectors. So like the traditional Ethernet jacks on your PC. And then you connect like the Nano, which is the bus master, to your first board with one Ethernet cable. And from the first board, you connect to the second one and so on. So next board. And then that's a little bit sometimes unexpected. The last port has to go back to the Nano. And there's always an in and an out port, and you always have to connect in to, uh, out to in. And then you close the loop, and this way the bus works. So there's no bus termination, no dip switches for addresses. It's just the order in the, um, in the bus. And that's something which later also like decides on what your numbering of your of your switches and coils will be so that that will give you about the the id it has that's automatically assigned so it's kind of a token ring with a with a master <laughs> um and that's what you will find in typical fast machines then there are like other fast boards there's a power entry board which is um very useful to have some kind of entry board and you do not necessarily have to use the fast one with the fast system so other power entry boards will work as well but it's very useful to have like central board where you connect your power supply you got fuses and then you fan out to all your node boards from there on and that's electrically useful to tie your grounds together that's um, from safety perspective like with fuses it's very very useful so uh, generally, it's, that's recommended to have something like that. Um, then there's something which is called the, the daughter board, the fast servo daughter board. That's this board. So I got um, a very early version. So that's that's the green. The newer ones are, are black, and that goes onto the the um, I/O boards, and you can have like six servos below the play field at any at any node board so i can show you how that works so if you look at this um at this uh, 3208 this will go here so it will just go on top of the board here and you can add servos um on those six connectors there and um so you take a servo like this one and this will then go here example and now you got the servo which is um which can work at any node port and so that's nice from from the location so that you get in the um servos where your node ports are so because if you got the servo controller in your back box then you need a lot of wiring so that's 
that's a nice option. And you do not even lose like switches. So um, this goes on top of here. I won't connect it now because it's powered on. And then like the, the first eight switches are just extended to above the board. So the sorts where before were here and they are extended to on top. That's very nice in my opinion. Um, often you will have like um, you will you will have one o eight o four in your cabinet, and then like so for for your flipper buttons, and then you will chain into the into below the play field and so on. And at any node board you can put like this one. And there's one um, uh, special uh, thing in the, in the node. Oh, sticky! Hi, thanks for thanks for subscribing. Actually, you're you're the first subscribing to my channel, so that's that's uh, that's the first. Thank you. So if you look at this, um, and yeah, now you got like a sticker first. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so what what you got here is um, you got like this this bus, right? I'm pointing to the slides and not showing them. <laughs> so if we go back to the bus here, that's the nano and that's the first board. And there's one special thing in the fast system. So the first eight switches on the first board, in this one, those can be used like in in any other board for flipper rules. Other than that. You can only use switches which are local to that board. So, like on, on, on a lot of other controllers, um, it's like on open pinball projects, for example, or on Spike, so on Spike, um, switch and coil have to be like on the same board. And um, there's like this special thing is like the first the first eight switches from the first board, they are available on all boards. That's very nice, and you have to consider that when designing your machine. Uh, Oh, you're building a mechanical pinball, so uh, that's that's cool. Um, mechanical pinball, but with 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 coils and electric electronics, right? Not uh, like not with pure mechanic, right? Or is it like like an electromechanical? Um, so is it? No, it's. I, I think it's not I squared C. So as far as I know, it's some RS four eighty. 485, so yeah, 485. That's what most manufacturers use, and I think fast isn't special there. So they use basically a serial protocol between the nodes. But as far as I know, it's also not documented this protocol. It's like a proprietary protocol, and um, I, I don't know how that technically works. But I think it's like some serial protocol, just just connecting one board to the next, um, and if they're using like Ethernet cables, that's also um, they can have like so like that's standard Ethernet cables here, right? So this bus can be pretty fast. So it can be probably run at like four megahertz or four megaboard or, or even more. So that's pretty nice. So it's a quite quite fast bo uh, bus. And as far as I know, you cannot easily saturate this bus. You can saturate the USB between your host and the the nano. That's possible, but and as far as I know, you cannot saturate the bus. Mm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, designing pinball machines there is is, is fun. It's um, I mean, there are a lot of decisions to make, and um, a lot of stuff to explore, and so many options. So it's it's generally fun. So I also like I built one like head-to-head -head machine, and now I'm basically in the planning state for the second machine and yeah it, it's it's tricky so <laughs> and the second one i want to do everything perfect and so everything takes forever <laughs> and there's less progress than on the first machine where just yeah let just do something and get it working uh, we'll video pinball first that's cool okay yeah, that's cool um yeah, maybe if you, you you can probably run like or create your own hardware platform and MPF for your hardware if you want. So that's that's possible. There are a lot of options for that. That's that's pretty cool. Um, 
yeah, I'm looking to looking forward to that. Do you do you document it somewhere on on Pinside or um, on on some forum or your blog or Instagram? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, then like what's uh, uh what other um what other bots are there? Yeah, the servo dot bot. I showed that. Then there is like a fast DMD. It's a color, color RGB DMD. It's very very cool. Unfortunately, it's not still not generally available. I think, but if you ask them, I think they they will say you one. Mm, so that's one of the boards. And then there's a, a new like segment display, color segment display from them, which is also not generally available, but uh there are some some people in the community which got prototypes so i guess it will be available in the near to medium future somewhere um yeah like um what about 64 64 pixel rgb panels so like the the fast dmd is um 32 versus 128 pixels and that's like a standard DMD resolution, um, like the virtual DMD, which I usually run here. Let's see. So basically this resolution, like like this one, so I can run here some some demo uh, events. So that's the resolution of the fast DMD. It's also RGB, uh, and it's like it's two China panels with uh, 32. I don't know. Is it 32 by 64? Yeah. Two two panels for 32 by 64? Probably, yeah. Uh, like same resolution as pin to DMD or like the smart metrics stuff. So it's technically a smart metrics display with, with kindly kind of improved firmware. So I got two of those in my machine, so that's why why I know those. It's it's great hardware. I I really like that one. Um and yeah, like the segment display is, I think, seven one seven segments and full color. That's that's basically new. There's like I don't think there are any full color segment displays, other other segment displays on the market than the fast one. That's pretty cool in my opinion. Um, yeah. So let's let's jump into it a little bit, and I will show you what I got. So. It's it's demo time. <laughs> Let's have fun uh, with like some hardware because that's the fun part. And therefore we go over here. So that's my setup here. So I got like I got a small power supply. It's an um, a meanwhile meanwhile I think that's fifty R D fifty A. That's a small supply which gives you five and twelve volts. It's very nice for like um, logic power, and it can even power your serial LEDs. Um, and that's what I'm also doing here. So first thing I got is I got like one serial LED here. It's just one uh, WS2812. Uh, yeah, 12. So it's one serial LED. It's connected to the first port here, and um, that's something we can we can try. I will just start my, my machine. Or we can also show the machine here. Um, okay. Running here. Okay. Now I've got MPF here. And we can, for example, turn it on. And ah, now you're no longer seeing it because. Oop, good like that. So I dimmed it down a little bit, so otherwise it would be too bright. So that's like it can do green. It can can also fi fade to other colors. So you can see it fades to red now. Not should fade to blue or also to white. So as you can see, it's it's nice fading. It's like that software fade done by MPF, but it's it looks really really nice. Um, and now it's off. Fade it off. And fade to green again, um, and you can. I think you can run 64 LEDs per chain, maybe even more. I'm not not exactly sure how long the chain can be. 
Um, but I, I think you can do like you can do a full machine with those four chains. That will be enough for a single machine. It's not like any any issue. Um, are those ferrite cores on your power? No. <laughs> uh, those are Molex connectors. Those are just Molex um, connectors. Like the older ones, I, I like those. So you can you can open those up and then put in any connectors. It goes from very small ones like uh, um, I think I don't know what the the American st stuff is, but in the European it's 0.014 millimeter square up to 2.5 millimeter square. Um, so like there are more like there are those are used for electrical installation in houses usually, and there are newer ones where you just put the connectors in and they snap in, but they are harder to remove. So I like those. Those are like you can buy I don't know. 25 pieces for 10 bucks on Amazon or something and for prototyping those are really useful so even if I just cut a wire somewhere I put like one Molex uh, Molex they are called Vago sorry Vago connector there and just to yeah just to insulate the the wire so that it won't show anything and this is really reliable that runs up to I don't know at least 20 30 amps so it's it's nearly impossible to kill those with power so um usually your wire will, will burn before those connectors burn and um, like they're relatively expensive if you want to do a production machine right soldering is less expensive but for prototyping um those are really nice and like there's no danger of shorts here there's no way that they come loose so they are also like very very like um vibration resistant so those are used those are like certified for everything. You can use them in your car. You can use them for house installation. Thermally to up to, I don't know, 150 degrees or something Celsius. And um, so they are, they are nice for, for prototyping. And those are like small, yeah, those are like those prototyping um, connectors, which basically go like this to the, to the PCB. Those are just for, I usually use those for for you my logic analyzer. So that's just for <laughs> connecting this small PCB that's a little bit fragile here. But I didn't have any other serial LEDs to show you, so that's why I got it this way. Um, yeah. And then like we got the the bus out is this side. There's also an arrow here. It's pretty hard to see. And bus in is here. So this one goes out to the other board here. that and um, this goes in here and then as I'm only got one board this goes out here again to the nano and um, so then uh, I got like this small setup here where I connected some inputs to outputs that's useful to for measuring the latency of the system I also ran that earlier today and um, that actually works pretty well so we can we can play with it a little bit so now i got like three switches configured that's the wrong view uh, three, three switches con configured and um i don't know if you can see that you can probably see that here i press the button um which i connected then you will see uh, on my um mc window uh, mbf window on top you will see that it becomes green right so it sees the switch that works fine i also connected one of the coils um which is um which is connected to the in to one of the inputs so you can pulse the coil and it should uh that's that's too fast for for the display to see um but we can run this mpf instance without text ui and then we will see the lock and <laughs> yeah, I got a segment display here. <laughs> okay, it's it's hard to see probably for you, but you can see that this is looped. So one of the coils here, let's loop back to one of the switches switch inputs, so we, that we can see how fast the system reacts to, like we pulse the coil, and how fast does the 
the switch uh, event make it back to MPF. And that's something we can measure. So we can now run like um, MPF hardware benchmark, like a command uh, which I wrote a while back. Let's, let's make this a little bit larger. You can see. Um, let's run this. Um, a coil power is usually connected here. So that's not through RG45. Only logic power is going through there. So um, let's start it off. Second high voltage is off, yes. So here I do not have high voltage, right? So a lot of systems got um, coils on the node boards or on the I.O. boards. Fast uh, doesn't do that. That's kind of special. So uh, this board only connects the coil to ground. So you connect your power supply um, high voltage to your coil. And then uh, the other side from the coil goes from the coil to the fast board. And you connect ground from the fast board to your power supply. So that's like kind of different. So you have to think about how you then fuse your, your different banks. So because there's not, not like a fuse per bank, like you got like, for example, on Spike or on the PROC system. And that's different here. So I would suggest to run like a few fuses um, in your machine at different points to, um, to have like fuses for different banks so that that like if a fuse blows that it limits it to a few coils, not to all of them. That's uh, my personal advice. So I got like um, a custom-made board below my play, play field for that, where, where which it has like RG45 connectors, like this board. So I connect the, the bus there to separate the play field from the machine. And I also put like power there and the distribute power from there. Um, I'm not sure if Fast offers one, but they are like those power, those they call like play field entry boards or something similar and um, i think spooky sells them and i think uh, Pim Pimbo Life, sorry Pimbo Life sells some I'm not sure about multimorphic and also not sure about fast they probably got one but i'm not sure how well available that is so and that's uh yeah that's something to think about it's in prototyping type says in the prototyping stage, that's not really needed. But uh, if you like want to run a commercial machine or like a machine on, which runs unattended, then that might be something to do. Um, so yeah, uh, right. The ground is here. So that's um, this this connector here is ground. Like there are three three grounds, and then it goes. Um, so basically this. Fats here, they connect the coil to ground. That's what that's that's always the same on all boards. But often ways they got like a power pin, like for example the P-Rock board, and then a fuse, and then a power output, so that you can also connect power from the board to the coil. So that's not that's not here. But um, I mean it's also like not technically needed. It's like a nice feature to have fuses, but it's not technically needed. One of the advantages of this design is that you can like run multiple voltages. So you can decide to run, I don't know, four coils on 48 volts and a few GIs on 12 volts or something. That's that that still works. Or that they say basically independent because they only tie together via ground here. Um, yeah. Right, and like uh, to the cut five cable here, um, there's only there's only I think five or twelve, very twelve volts, yeah, because like the the switches run on twelve volts, so yeah, that will be probably both voltages. Um, I mean, it can run like GIs or anything, which does not like. I mean, it's a thermal problem, right? Um so those those um pads here they can i don't know they can dissipate about like like because they're air cooled they can dissipate probably one one watt of power maximum, probably a little bit less, so that's like a thermal problem, 
And if they overheat, if they dissipate more power, then they will burn at some point. Um, so you can run like a motor if it runs at like one amp or something at 12 volts, that won't be an issue. They are pretty low drop. Um, so you can look at the part number. It's the standard standard part. It's what is it L five four O N S. Okay, you can probably Google them, and then you can see how much like voltage they drop, and then you can just multiply voltage versus your your power draw, so your current, right? And then you know how much heat they will dissipate, and there there will be some limit probably in a data sheet how much uh, they can dissipate and how much yeah basically can be cooled. And if you look at them, they are pretty close. So if you run like those two at full full power, then at some point the board will heat up. So just have to look at the heat here. So motors are usually not a problem. Coils will work, GIs will work. I mean, if you've got a really large GI string, it's probably a problem to run it on one FET. But just look at the current draw. I guess most of the stuff, those those are pretty pretty good FETs. Yeah, right. Like I mean, there's no active cooling yet, right? You could you could put like uh, some some cooling, um, yeah, like some cooler on top, right? Some metal shield or something. For this is just the board, and it's it's a little bit metal in there, but it's not that much. So there are limits. <laughs> and I mean, if you draw like too much current, if you got 48 volts and you put the coil on permanently. And they will also burn up a few seconds, right? But that's also like a lot of power then. So usually that that's not not an issue. So um, I ran my benchmark now, and even with with stream running, it's super. It's looking super cool. So what this does is um, it pulses like the coil, which is connected to an input, and then we put a, a rule, like a flipper rule, on this input. To pulse another coil, and that's that coil is again connected to the to a second switch, and then we measure like the the latency of all that, and that way we can see how long does it take for MPF to pulse a coil and get back that the switch changed, and how fast are switch rules or like yeah hardware rules in the system, and that's what we can see here. So we got like three different experiments with different pulse durations here. And different pause durations between, and we can see that the average latency is something like six and a half to seven milliseconds, which is pretty good, even especially since the stream is running and next to it, so the CPU is loaded. It's a little bit better without the stream, but not much actually. So for other systems, this has been much worse. So during stream, they were with like ten milliseconds worse than without stream. And we can see like rule latency is like about three, two to three milliseconds. That's probably like related to debounce times. Um, but that's also pretty good. And also like the variance, it's um, really good. So if I compare it to like the other systems we benchmarked, that's probably the best we've seen so far against like the standard settings of. Um, like Multimorphic and Open Pinball Project. And I also did some other, which I didn't show. But I think that's the best I've seen so far. But it's also it always depends on your PC, on your USB settings, on the load of your PC, and a lot of factors, right? So that's not generally better, probably. But that's, that's pretty good. So that looks really good. Um, uh, yeah, like there's some variance here, but the variance is always very low, so that's that's great. That's actually great. Didn't expect that. <laughs> so that's good. That's really good. Um yeah. So like for, for normal pinball machines, uh, you got like two types of coils or you flipper coils, right? You got single wand and dual wand. Um, modern machines often got single wand, so they they pulse a coil initially with like 30 milliseconds something, and then they they um, run like a duty cycle, so PWM with like three milliseconds on, one milliseconds off, 
something like that. So usually like a duty cycle of 50%, something around that 40, 30, 40, 50%, um, just to keep the magnetic field up. Um, for older machines or sometimes also newer machines, there are dual wound coils, which got like two, well, two, yeah, this is two coils, just wound uh, on top of each other. One like strong coil, which is pulsed initially with 30 milliseconds again, and then the other one, which is then activated permanently, but it has a higher resistance and therefore can be enabled permanently. And that's also possible, but for that you need one driver more. But that driver has like a larger resistance and less current will flow, and therefore it won't be like a heat problem. Um, yeah, so if you pulse coils for up to, I would say like 100 milliseconds, there's like no way you can burn this. Probably you can probably short the fat. I don't do it, but you can probably short it and pulse it at 100 milliseconds and that thing will survive. Um, uh, yeah, this PWM can be actually done in hardware. So basically all of the pinball controllers, that's one of the features they have. Um, they they can pulse um, they can pulse coils for very exact um, time. So you can say pulse it for 100 milliseconds, and it will be exactly 100 milliseconds. Because if you do it in software, there will be jitter um, because of the transmission between hardware and uh, the, the software framework. And therefore, we will we will just say the hardware pulse it for that time, and it will do that. And the same for PWM. MPF will just tell the hardware put it on for 10 milliseconds, then put it off for three, put it on again, and, and go on until I tell you differently. So that's what all the hardware can do for you. And that's one of the two main features. The one is like pulsing calls and enable them with PWM. And the second one is like hardware rules, how we call that. So that's, we tell the hardware, if this switch becomes active, then turn that coil on for that pulse time and afterwards that PWM, for example. So those are basically the two main features of pinball controllers why we absolutely need them. That's something which would be really, really hard to do that in like in Python or, or any high level language because of like the latency and jitter constraints. So that's um how that works. <laughs> and then they they got like switch inputs and lights and so on. Um, yeah, like yeah, but like 30 milliseconds is like not super, it's not super long, right? And in, even if you would like sometimes only pulse the coil for 40 and sometimes for 20 milliseconds, that would be super noticeable to the player. So that then the, the flipper would be like sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker and so on. So it has to be pretty much the same every time. And also like if you push the flipper, bu flipper button, the, the coil should be active after, I don't know, two milliseconds, or like in this case, an average 2.8 milliseconds. And that should be always like the same time, because then then you can get used to the delay it, it has, right? And if this varies, that's very annoying, and it's super not fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. I mean, even if you got a scope or something, just if you scope the outputs, that's that's super fun. And if you look like this, that's yeah, that's super super nice here. So that's that's how it's supposed to be. Um, oops. No, yeah. So that's basically my hardware setup here already. So I showed the, the LED, I showed the board, and I I only got one here because um I got this in one of my my machines, and I didn't want to um remove so many boards. I had a spare o, a 3208 and I uh, removed the Nano uh, that will go back into my machine. Uh, but I didn't want to add, uh, remove any other boards, but they look the same. <laughs> I mean, it's just then it's, it's more boards. So one more thing we can look at is actually um, how this is configured. So I prepared um, a small machine which is also running here so let's, let's start it again um so that's this machine here um and 
that has like virtual DMD and virtual segment displays here, which can show funny stuff here. And I configured the fast hardware. And this works like this way. So we got like a new file, which is just for the hardware, where I first configured the, the platform. So I tell, tell MPF, this platform is fast. I also got some stuff on virtual, for example, the DMD, which is why I also listed it here. But the first platform, the primary platform is fast. Um, then we configure driver boards. There's like either fast boards, that's the node board. Um, it's what on the PROC is, um, how it's called, a PDB. And there's also like WPC, for example, here. So you can put this to WPC if you got one of the WPC prototypes or I mean, probably if you talk too fast and um, just buy enough boards, they will probably also sell you the WPC board, I guess. Um, so that's that's what you configure here. And there's a fast section, and there you configure the the use uh, the, the serial ports, right? On on Windows, this would be COM one, two, three, something. And this board, um, if you connect it, it will expose like four serial ports because there's a quad FTDI chip on it. So it's a USB serial chip and it's like, it's a rather expensive chip. It's also like good. Um, but it's like, if, if a chip is more than like one buck, then it's quite expensive in electronics. So that chip is definitely more than one buck. And um, it provides like four serial ports and they only use two of them. So the other two are available on the board if you want to connect something via serial to your PC. Usually the second and the third port are the ones uh, which you are using. So this is then the net CPU, that's the bus master. And then there's the, um, what's called, uh, the RGB, the RGB CPU, that's the one which drives the, the lights. And we can also look at that. We can run MPF hardware scan. It's always always useful if you configure your machine. And that will now tell us that um, it found like fast hardware and there's like a net CPU connected and an RGB CPU connected with like firmware version 1.05 and 1.0. No, no, no DMDs and no segment controllers. I mean, it just iterates all the ports and sees what's there, right? And then it also can iterate the boards, which is super nice. And now I can see that I got a 3208 2. That's probably, I guess that's like the hardware revision 2 or something. Let's see. Yeah, that's also like printed on the board. So that's probably a hardware revision 2. Um, and like with firmware version 1.5, that usually should match your net CPU. Um, it should auto update. Sometimes if you update net CPU, you have to power cycle the system one or two times. And then it will auto update all the node boards. And if you run hardware scan in this time, you will see that the first one updated, then the second, the third, and so on. And it will tell you like how many switches and drivers this had this has, right? That's super nice because then MPF knows your exact hardware setup. And if you configure drivers which are not on this board, then it will tell you that this switch physically does not exist and that you might want to check your hardware numbers. Um, yeah, that's what you can do here. It's uh, rather simple, but very useful. Uh, but you have to configure the ports here. Then you can have like hardware fades, but that's basically a fixed fade time. So that's what MPF will use to fade the LEDs. So that will also be then your shortest time you can flash your LED, for example. And like something like 20 milliseconds or 30, that's, that's usually a good idea because that's also like the frequency on how often MPF will update the LEDs. So I will set this to 20. I think it's default to zero. So then it will be pure software fade in MPF. 20 is probably a good setting because um, MPF will set it it lights at 50 hertz and then it will be 20 milliseconds between each update and that will be then faded in hardware and if you looked at my fade here that's also something which which looks really really nice so um start this again show you so very smooth right 
now it fades over to red, blue, and to white. <laughs> so I can also fade it off. So that looks nice in my opinion. Um, yeah, so that's that's what the setting is for. And then we can configure switches, and I configured like so that like the syntax here is first there is like the the board number which is zero, the first board indexed by by zero, right? And then that's just the switch number. The nice thing is that those are printed on the board. So um, if you look here on the board, it's printed here next to the connectors. It's probably not good to see for you, but um, I like it that they, they documented all their connectors on the board. Not all manufacturers do that, but it's super nice because you do not have to get like the manual for every time you want to connect something. It's just printed there. Um, and yeah, I connected like this one at 24 and 25 and 31. Yeah, so to the last one at 31. And that's what I put here, like the first board, and then um, which is 24, 25, 26, uh, sorry, 31, last one. And if I had like another board, like board one, then I would put it this way. And we can try to start this machine. So let's, let's do this. Um, Let's, let's start this and you will see that MPF will be unhappy because board one does not exist for switch 130 to 31. Because MPF knows that there isn't any board with ID one in my system, my system. So there's only one board. Um, so my opinion, it's super nice for, for, for playing around with it. So if you, if you see that error, probably your board isn't connected <laughs> or something. Then uh, we got lights. The syntax is exactly the same. So it's like the first chain. So like there's only on the RGB CPU, there are chains, like okay, four chains. So it's zero to three. And then afterwards is the index of the, of the light in the chain. So that's the first LED in my chain because there's only one, right? And it's type RGB. Uh, so you can tell it like the channel order on your, on your light. Can also be like uh, GRB, for example, if it's um, yeah, if it's if it's that order. So that depends on your on your light, right? Um, then I got some light players here to turn this uh, to different colors. That's what I just showed you. And at the end, we also got coils. So the numbering is exactly the same. It's again the board first, the so board zero, and um, then I got connected uh, by zero and coil four. So it's again printed on the board, that's nice. And uh, yeah, you put it exactly this way. And if I put, for example, 10 here and my board does not have the 10th coil, it will also tell me that um, crashed, yeah. Uh, board zero only has eight drivers, driver 0, 10. So it tells me that I messed up. And I like direct feedback. So that's that's what I really like about the system. Um, that, if, that MPF knows if stuff is there or isn't, right? So uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's it. And this is basically how you define a flipper coil. This one is one with like, uh, with, with a single, um, the single coil. So it's a single wound flipper uh, because it only has like a main coil here activated by switch one and it will then pulse and activate coil two. We can also have like um I think it's called hold hold coil hold coil and then we can put yeah coil one here for example and then it would also use like then it would be a single single a uh, dual mount coil right so it would have a main coil and a hold coil like on older machines and that's that's how this works in MPF. Like I mean, even the the early the early spike machines had dual mounts, but I think for software reasons. But like Spike Sam had two single mounts, and like all the later uh, Stern spikes also have single mounts again, probably for cost saving reasons. So, but a lot of people in homebrew uh, say that um, 
newer ones are nicer because you got less thermal problems and um, they are also like they're, they're silent when up and especially if you got the glass off on your machine it's super annoying if it's sometimes always it's only it's, 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 um, yeah making noises so that's something um, in my opinion to consider <laughs> Uh, I got single wound in my machine, and yeah, sometimes sometimes it annoys me. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is basically the benchmark stuff which I just ran. It's just the benchmark config section. Um, you got the benchmark, and that's already like how you configure the fast stuff. Um, if you want, for example, more LEDs, it's often useful to use this syntax like light two, and now we can tell it previous is light one. And that way, it can automatically calculate the number for that light. That's very useful. Often ways you have to still give it like the type if it's RGB, BRG, or something else. You can also use like RGBW LEDs on fast. That also will work. And like on almost any um, serial LED controller. So it's like a nice. It's a nice package. And I personally really like that this those boards got coils and switches and like also like the, the the number of switches to coils is really nice on the 3208 and also on the uh, 0804 so those would be my recommendations to get one of each of those or maybe two of the 0804s um, and then you should be fine for most standard machines if you know that you want like a lot of coils then yeah get more boards <laughs> It's never wrong to have spares uh, because if you, I mean, you might burn one for reasons and then uh, it will take a few weeks to get another one. That's uh, sometimes annoying. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's always like uh, a matter of money and comfort and timing. Um, uh, yeah, so those are basically so those switches are pulled up to 12 volts so it's usually one kilo kilo ohm resistor to 12 volts so they are pulled up to 12 volts and um, you have to pull them down no matter how that works so if you just connect the switch to get yeah, a switch to ground that will pull the voltage down to ground and i think it's if it's down below like six volts something then it will be active in software so as long as it can do that, it will work. Sometimes you need like some additional circuitry for that. But standard optos, for example, just work. You can connect them. They will, yeah, they will connect it to ground. That will work. Even um, even for example, those those are like. Um, those are, are they magnetic. I don't know how, how they're called. They are, I don't know, it's Hall effect, but they will basically detect a ball above it and um, they will also work on a fast input, for example, because they can, you got there, there are some which are connecting, which are driving low, so to ground, and there are some which are connecting to voltage right to, to 12 volts or 5 volts or whatever the power supply is this one this one will connect to ground and this one can also just be connected to an input and it will just work and this one will detect like a ball like for like an 8 millimeter range so it doesn't go through a complete play field but if you cut the play field for like 5 or 6 millimeters from below so half through it, then this will detect a ball above the play field. So and those are like, I don't know, less than ten bucks on AliExpress or Amazon. Um, so those those are from China. They work, for example, really well. I know that those alien, um, I think it's Hall effect sensors. They also work on fast. So there are like multiple versions like this one. So it's it's rather rather large. But it will go completely below the play field and it can sense a ball in an inlane or something. So 
that's that's nice you can put them below like inserts also there are some people which printed 3d parted uh, which printed parts in a 3d printer which can carry like an led plus this um, connector for example so that's for homebrew that's really nice those are often used in 3d printers for uh, sensing the bed so they go down and then the, the printer senses the, the bed and they are also like often used in industrial automation so very very reliable stuff um, which also works for pinball and for other stuff um, yeah you might need to add a resistor for example just to drive it low or drive it to ground and um, sometimes that's needed but for those for example it just works and yeah, obviously I also got like a, a Vago connector on here because it works with any wires. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what Fast currently does not have is like steppers. Um, and yeah, like they don't have like an explicit motor controller or something. But um, yeah, what I probably forgot earlier is that they also got like some um, some opto boards which can power optos and then also I think invert the opto um, input signal that's sometimes needed um, they got a board, board for that and probably an, a few other things and one more thing is like they got a starter kit and that's really nice because it's I mean it, it, got, it got the power supply it got like the boards you need typically need if you go with something like that that's also like a good entry and you do not have to think about too much what you what you're getting and what you need and so on so uh, in my opinion that's also that's super nice um, yeah and yeah today today i got my cobra pin stuff so and um, i now got like a lot of cool stuff to play with and uh, we will probably look at that like next week saturday or in two weeks on saturday but i will show you one thing just this one because that will also work with the fast system and that's uh, those nice um, segment displays and um got two of them so uh, thomas uh, sent me those two i think one is blue and one is um blue red this one is blue according to the label and the other one is red and the cool thing about those is that they are actually serial leds so those are the ws2811 uh, chips right here on top on the bottom and um, those are connected by only like only like three connectors and those will also work on the fast nano so you can connect it to the serial port um, of the nano and uh, it can then drive those those uh, segment displays and that's um yeah probably also available soon um i'm super excited to play with this one later <laughs> and i will show you in a, in a future stream how they work um, it's great stuff <laughs> in my opinion uh yeah so if you got any more questions about the fast system or like MPF in general or pinball in general, um, then uh, let let me know. Um, so otherwise, like that's that's what I wanted to show. <laughs> and um, yeah, we will have more like on on Wednesday. Yeah, pretty sure we'll have something on Wednesday. And um, I don't know really know what I will do on Wednesday um but uh something uh i got like maybe i will like show the raspberry pi so how you can use like the raspberry pi as port extender in mpf um because like you can use the raspberry pi by ethernet in mpf to um to connect inputs and outputs and also i squared c stuff um and that's like it's a really like a nice add-on for if you if you got an existing control system and you just need some inputs on your topper or somewhere for your special features then you can use your raspberry pi as port extender and that's that's in my opinion it's really 
nice thing which very few people do um <laughs> yeah i mean the the good thing about like mpf um if i if i may praise uh, my own system <laughs> or our own system is that you can do like everything virtually and then later connect it to real hardware and with very few changes it will just work so that's that's the nice thing but um some people do like the game virtually and then build it some people build a physical game and then program it <laughs> yeah chris is right it's magic it's it's all magic and yeah i also need to do one on like virtual pinball engine and like the new i, I always see it as the new um vpx and like the new visual pinball uh, in unity but uh, i also still need to install it because i i didn't install unity uh, on my pc yet because on linux it's a little bit tricky but it should work and maybe i will also do that but i guess like the raspberry pi is something uh, which is nice to show and um, probably interesting for a lot of people because it's like it's a really cheap solution which is really really awesome in my opinion um so guys uh, thanks for for joining thanks thanks for bearing with me um i i wish you like um a nice remaining saturday today um and like a nice remaining weekend uh, keep on keep on hacking pinball <laughs> have fun that's the most important thing i mean most of us do, do not do this commercially uh, we do this for fun and it's important to to keep the fun otherwise it becomes work and then it's no longer our hobby right <laughs> always always the the right danger of that um so uh thanks guys have a great evening and uh, see you soon